This is a podcast by Wellhouse Church, where personal spiritual growth is fueled through a variety of practices rather than a single prescriptive time of devotion, where we discuss different spiritual practices that help us be more present with God, others, and ourselves. What's going on, practitioners? How we doing? Hey, hey, hey. Good to be back. Absolutely. Good another, to be back. Another episode on prayer. It's been a while since we recorded. I just realized. Yeah, it's been over a week. Yeah, we record weekly content, but just in the way it fell, it had been a while. Yeah, it's been like a week and a half since yeah. last time we recorded. Crazy. Mm. Crazy. Just the way everything fell, our, our lives, Just our this schedules. week, yeah. Crazy, crazy. But it is good to be back. It is good to have another episode. And I'm excited about what we're doing today for this episode. This is one prayer practice that I have no experience with. Okay, so you need to. Let me let me start this episode. Clearly from the title, you get what it is, inner healing prayer. And here's what I want to say. Before we get into the actual practice, I think this is an immensely important prayer practice. Mm. Because... As we are learning more and more about trauma and brokenness, gone are the days where the expectation is that trauma is for rape victims and war veterans. Mm, yeah. Trauma is a much broader category. And there are things that the average person experiences that are now in a possibility of being a trigger for a clinical diagnosis of trauma. Yeah. For instance, divorce yeah. is one of betrayal. those that is now can be, yes, yeah, so a betrayal would be another one, but just a sheer divorce. If your divorce is messy, you, you've you given your life over to someone. Nobody gets married expecting they're going to get divorced. Yeah. So that means you expected to live your life with this person and you're giving up on a dream. Yeah. That can be a traumatic thing for some people. Death, mm. just death and losing someone yeah. can be a traumatic experience, either in the manner in which you lost them or, or just losing them in general. Or just losing them in general. Trauma is something that is a much bigger category, and that doesn't even classify brokenness. No. Right? People can experience immense brokenness and self worth issues when they lose their job, mm -hmm. when they get fired, when they're rejected. Um, brokenness and trauma are things that all of us deal with. And for a long time, go ahead. So I just want to, I, I want to go on a personal slash social work. You, you won't see me do this often. Um, little rant here, but, um, something that I learned through my social work education and through my own personal therapy is that trauma is completely relative as well. Oh, yeah, 100% relative and subjective. Um, I had a therapist. I don't know if, maybe I've talked about this on this podcast before. I don't remember. Um, I had a therapist ask me one time, write up your five most traumatic experiences. And I was writing them out, and um, I was looking at it, and I was like, really? These are These are the things? this doesn't seem like it should cause me this much pain. It doesn't seem like this should be the, all that traumatic. But that's what I had experienced. Yeah. Those were traumatic events to me. Yeah. Um, because that is the most trauma I've ever experienced. Right. right. Um, and so when you, when you think about trauma um, as relative, it becomes easier to be able to empathize with people. But yeah, absolutely. Um, and so this is where the social work piece comes in. Yep. Empathy is an extremely important thing that each individual needs, that everyone needs to be able to do. Yeah. Um, everyone. I don't care what job you're in, what spiritual tradition you're from. If you cannot empathize with people, 
you need to do some work on yourself. Well, yeah. I mean, on that same line, we're called numerous times to care for our neighbor, to love our neighbor. You can't do that without empathy for their problems. Yeah. And the first step to, to empathy is recognizing the, the, the subjective view of trauma. Yes, correct. That is a good point. And I was, tr- I was trying to get there, but you expl- I mean, oh, you named sorry. it. No, no, no. I, Cause I was fixing to move on and okay. I hadn't named trauma as relative and subjective, which it is. Um, trauma to you might not be something for me, Yeah, but uh, I mean, my, it doesn't mean it's any less harmful. Yeah, exactly. I mean, my, my parents divorced when I was nine months old, they split and I had one parent that was trying their best and I had another parent that was a drug addict. Mm -hmm. I got a lot of trauma on one half of my childhood. There are going to be things that you experienced Mm -hmm. on the good side of, of my family that I'm probably looking at going, yeah, that's not trauma to me. Yeah. But I've seen crap that you couldn't imagine. I've experienced crap that you couldn't imagine. Yeah. But in the same way, that doesn't mean that yours is not trauma or mine is even more traumatic. It, because, it doesn't mean that it's any less valid. Well, yeah, because that's the point. If if trauma is subjective and relative, that also means the manner in which you experience trauma changes how you interact with trauma. Yeah. And so because of the trauma that I've experienced, I've become more calloused. Mm. I have, I'm a more hard person. And I'm not going to say strong. Because it's, it's not a question of strength. It's just you can only be cut and experience things so many times in the same spot before it becomes scar tissue. Yeah. The manner in which I deal with trauma is very different than the manner in which you deal with trauma because I've dealt with different trauma yeah. and possibly more of it. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't make your trauma any less real to you. No. And that's true for all of the practitioners as well. Every single person. Um. Like the reason that we're talking about this is because it's an important topic that that you need to look at for yourself. Yeah. Um, and maybe you should do that little practice. What are the five most traumatic things that you've ever experienced? Yeah. And write them out. Yeah. Write down the stories. Yep. With pen and paper. Yeah. Write it out. Yeah. So all of that lead up is important because I think For a long time, our culture has said that the only part of your body that needs healing is what we can see biologically. Mm, mm -hmm. So anything going on in your spirit, anything going on in your mind, it doesn't matter. Toughen up. Pull up your bootstraps. Which is just bass backwards. Yeah, it's asinine. Yeah, it, it, it makes no sense to me. If and this is evident by the stigma around mental health even now. Well, and there's been lots of studies coming out that I've been reading. Um I've been reading a lot about this lately because I'm doing some some research for a class about the the connection between um or the impact of substance abuse on the social relationship quality of young adults. Yeah. Um and So I've been reading a lot about um, loneliness um, and the negative effects that that loneliness can have um, on your body. Yeah. It it can give you medical problems. Yeah. Um, So that just shows that your mental state really can affect your body. Yeah. Well, and it's because, I mean... Well, there's neurological things that go into all that and like, well, of course there, there's like a whole nother conversation, but, um, yeah, your mental state is extremely important to your physical well-being. Correct. As is your emotional state. Well, yes. Um, and so with all of that, I think for a long time, we just kind of ignored emotional and mental health and I think now we're coming around and realizing, especially from the pandemic, like just realizing, like (laughs) I saw this, I saw this thing on Instagram and it, it was funny, but it's also just revealing to me. 
it's a man sitting in a car with his wife and you can't see the man. And he goes, Hey honey, you got two options. There's a new pandemic starting and we're going into lockdown option a, you get to spend all of your time with your husband. And before he can say B, she goes B B and he goes, you haven't even heard of it. She goes B I, no more danger for the a like B I don't want. And it just goes to show like we live in rhythms that mask some of our emotional and mental health pains that when we get out of those rhythms, those become real and apparent and we don't want to deal with them. And so we fill our lives with this busyness to help mask that, to help make sure we don't, I mean, mm-hmm. it's no different. Like I'm, I'm guilty of this. I hadn't been to the doctor in like eight years. That's probably no cap. Like I hadn't been to the doctor in a long time. Wow. You like, need to go get a checkup. I do. I do. I just don't, I don't go to the doctor. Uh, I go to the doctor for my kids, go to the doctor with my wife, but like I myself just don't go to the doctor. I'm the dude that at 19 years old, cut my arm open on a piece of st- and super glued it himself. He's still got a really bad oh, score. Yeah, it's massive. Wait, where is it? Oh, it's on this arm. Yeah. Um, like I just don't go to the doctor, but yet when, when something's wrong, I know something's wrong and I go get help. So if I need to go to the doctor, I will start therapy. Like, I will go get help when I need it. The problem is we haven't done a good job of giving people space to explore getting help in their emotional and mental places. This is where inner healing prayer comes in. Yeah, I do want to tell a quick story. Okay, and then we need to talk about inner healing prayer. Yeah. We had a beer brewing accident. Um, What was it? Three years ago now? Four um, years ago? Yeah, three or four years ago. Cullen's got a really bad scar on his foot from it. Um, And uh, it it like, I, the, the accident happened on my face and on his foot. Yeah. Um, I went to the doctor immediately almost. Yeah. Cullen didn't go to the doctor at all. And weren't you told it was like third degree burns on your face? It was, uh, it was second degree second degree and the burn on my because yours was more splattered it was splattered on my neck and up on my face and mine was isolated to one spot yeah on your foot on my foot and so looking at your face and comparing to my foot mine was probably third degree Mm. you went to the doctor i never went to the doctor yeah he should have gone we tried to get him to go he wouldn't go yeah i just i don't go to the doctor (laughs) it's Um, like no i'm fine it's fine i gotta clean this up Joey doesn't share food. <laughs> How is that relevant? <laughs> Just because he's so passionate. I'm like, I don't go to the doctor. Anyways, inner healing prayer. Yeah. So that, everybody hit Cullen up, tell him to go get a physical. Yeah. They're not going to do that. They never do. Yeah. They, sh- everyone, everyone they're leave comments, gonna. text Cullen. He needs to go to the doctor. If I get hit up, if I get hit up 10 times on Instagram, I'll five go. Five times. Nope, 10. Five times. 10. Five times. Five's achievable. 10. <laughs> five ten. times. How much do they care about my health? Seven. 10. Seven. 10. You're not going to win this one. 10. 10. <laughs> if I get hit up 10 times on Instagram, on Instagram, don't text me. No. If you text me, don't count. That's not. Wh- Do it on Insta. Okay. Fine. If I get hit up 10 times, I'll go to the doctor. Fine. All right. Inner healing prayer. So what is this? This is not a um, a set detailed out practice like some of the other ones. It's not like the breath prayer. It's not it's not like fasting. There's there's no ritualistic aspect of this prayer practice. It's a posture. Yeah. It's a manner in which you're praying and what you're seeking out of prayer. But it's also not contemplative because you're not you're not contemplating on God. You've, if you're doing this prayer, you've already come to a place where God is healer. Mm. So it's not a contemplative practice either. It is a petitionary practice. Mm. You are asking for him to be healer in your life. Mm. And so the, so for Adele here, what she says is that the desire of the inner healing prayer is to assist the emotionally broken and wounded as they seek God for the healing only he can give. You've come to a place where you acknowledge that healing comes from God. Yeah. And so the desire here is to receive that healing from God. The definition of this, and this, I love this. 
She says, prayer for inner healing invites those with emotional wounds to enter the safe and healing presence of Jesus. I'm going to pause here. This is not the end of her definition, but when I picture this, you got, no, I'm a storyteller. Like I, I need to see the story play out in my head. This safe space for me is embodied in the image of Jesus saying, let the children come to me mm. because everyone around these children, these children are vulnerable they need to get into the presence of Jesus. And there are things outside of Jesus, outside of themselves, hindering them to get there. And Jesus says, uh-uh, let them come to me. Yeah, This is a safe space. And then she goes on and says, in this safe place, those seeking wholeness and freedom open themselves to listen to Jesus and his word to them. I say it all the time. We are broken, traumatized people. If church and the faith community is not a place of healing and wholeness, we're doing it wrong yeah. because that is what we as people need. It's what people of faith need. That's what people in general need. That's what humanity needs. Jesus came because we were in need of healing and wholeness. Uh, so somebody who attends Wellhouse, um, who... Um I'm sure they wouldn't mind me telling this story. Um, who is in recovery um, referred to what we do here as like rehab church. Yeah, rehabilitative church. Yeah, um, and that is the goal. Yeah, um, that is what church should be. It it should be this place of healing and wholeness, and that that's why I think this practice is so good because. We're all looking for that. Yeah. And look, we have, I know I'm a weird pastor because I share things that other pastors don't share, but I've always said it. I think culture comes from the top and I want this to be a place where we can all be real. Like I want this to be a safe space. And so I try to live out our cultural value. Like I try to be real and I still find myself wanting healing and wholeness. Yeah. Like as the pastor of this church, I still find myself needing healing and wholeness because brokenness doesn't just go away. Even when you fix something that's broken, there's still remnants of what was broken. If I if I have a vase and I drop it on the ground, it is broken. But if I super glue all the pieces back together, it's still a vase. It functions like a vase but I can also tell that it has scars. I can tell that it's been broken and we are a new creation. As Paul says, you, all things are being made new, but that's our, that's our culmination. That's the, the, that's the end of the story right now. You are a broken person being restored. You know, back to the, the vase metaphor too. Um, you may not be able to put all the pieces back together. Yeah, there may be holes. There may be pieces of that vase missing um, that you will find in other places. Um, we are a broken people. And the, the, the crazy thing is that those holes, those scars, um, God's love and God's mercy can can fill those holes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Well, and I think Adele makes a great point here that we have a friend, his name's Jake Porter, and he's a, he's a CSAT, a sex, sex, a certified sex addiction therapist. He does betrayal trauma. He's just an addiction specialist. Like he, he's one of our partners. We refer people to him all the time. He's a dear friend of mine. He says all the time, you can't act your way into something you can pray your way out of. Yep. If you act your way into something, you've got to also act your way out of it. And that's true. And Jesus affirms that. Interestingly enough, when it comes to healing, it's one of the places where most prominently we see in Jesus inviting us to participate in the healing. 
So in John chapter 9, there's this question about a man that's been born blind. And the religious leaders come to Jesus and they say, hey, who, who sinned in order that this man be born blind? And Jesus is like, no, you missed it. Nobody sinned that he be born blind. And Jesus heals him. But before he heals him, he asks him a question. He says, do you want to be well? Mm. Because healing changes things. Um, the, when Jesus heals the lame person at the pool of Bethesda, Jesus asks him, do you want to be well? Yeah, what, what am I doing here? Because when we're made well, there's something different. Things change. We're, there's a new expectation upon us. Somebody who's been born blind and been blind their whole life is, is, is a beggar yeah. or, or their family takes care of them. But, but if I heal you, your life's about to radically change because now you're an able-bodied person who can go work. Yeah. Healing changes things. And we've got to be ready for the changes that come. And so healing is one place where Jesus invites us in to participate in the healing because it's going to change things. It's going to change expectations for us. Like we say, there's grace for all things. If you are still dealing with your brokenness and trauma, there's grace for you not participating in the gifts of the spirit that God's given you in the ways that he expects you to act for the glorification of the kingdom of God. Yeah. But if you experience healing in those areas, there's a new expectation on the way in which you bring about the message of the kingdom of God to people. Healing changes things. And those are good things. Yeah. That's the deal. Don't when I say healing changes things, those are good things. The ability to participate in the activity of the kingdom of God in new ways is a good thing. Yeah. And so I want to end here with just a couple of exercises that Adele kind of leaves us with. Um because it's not really an easy thing to do. I mean, we've talked a lot about the posture, the need for it, how you pursue it, what it is, the desire, all those kinds of things. But actually some, some practical ways to do it would be helpful. And so one of the things she said, and I love this one, she says, read Lamentations 2 and 3. I always tell people this. It's okay to mourn and grieve. It's okay to lament. People forget because we're not good readers of our Old Testament and we don't like the boring books. There's an entire book of the Bible called Lamentations. Yeah. Like it is nothing but laments. Yeah. It's okay to grieve and mourn. Like just know that as part of your inner healing, you're going to have to grieve and mourn and that's okay. Read Lamentations 2 and 3. Allow Jeremiah's painful cry to become your own prayer. Write a lament of your own to God. What do you want to tell him about your pain? Where do you want to find him in your pain? Mm. That's the deal, man. If you believe that God is healer, then you believe that God is experiencing your pain with you. Mm. Yeah. And so to truly do inner healing prayer, and this is what I would leave you with, you're going to have to be vulnerable. Healing doesn't come through being guarded. Healing comes through being vulnerable before Jesus for the purpose of having Jesus's healing, miraculous touch impact your life in new, miraculous, wholesome ways.